This is Sale GP Moments, and I'm Stevie Morrison. The first moment of the day that we're going to look at is Nathan Outridge approaching a windward mark, and we've seen him in that situation before recently. Well, who doesn't remember that incident in our house? And in this situation, the roles are a little bit different. As we're going to stop the action any moment here, we can see boat number one, Nathan Outridge. He's coming in. Boat number two, Peter Burling. It's all about who's going to enter the yellow circle to the left of our screen. On the inside, it's Burling. He's got the right to turn there. And Nathan Outridge, well, he made advantage of that in our house. But as we stop the action here, look, he's seen Burling coming in. And a dramatic change of direction of his course up in towards the wind, slowed the boat down 27 kilometers an hour and he's off the foil. Now, Burling, he's got the right to take a left turn, to turn inside, he has that mark room. But if he continues straight, well, it's old school sailing rules, starboard hand boat has the right of way and Nathan Outridge would keep the rights. Nathan sailing his boat slowly is giving Pete the opportunity to go in there. He's making sure he's got no chance of breaking any rules and he forces Burling to duck behind him and sail out the other way. Now, right now we're zooming on the action here and Nathan just at this point is entering that three boat length zone and it's only then that he starts to say, right, I'm clear of all the other boats. I've had my obligation. I'm going to start turning left. So he was really clever with the rules in our house, but he knows the rules and he's used them to his advantage again there. But this is a scenario that has been the topic of discussion for some time among the teams. And I'm sure this will continue to be a hot topic going forwards. This is an example of how far back a winning move can start. Approaching the gate number four here, and the Danish team, good jibe, appear to be on a good ley line. They're making it in for that left turn at gate number four. Jimmy Spittel on board the America boat, ironically, not as good a jibe. He's not looking at that mark. It's not even in his thought process. Let's get going fast. Let's build speed. And Jimmy knows he's got an extra jibe to do. But the Danish, well, they're tempted by that mark. We can get there, but it's a bit of a risk if we end up getting slow. Here on board the Danish boat here, a little bit of indecision at this stage here. As we come back to the action and pause it, the Danish now aren't going to make that left turn. So for them, option is we've got to do a jibe. We've got to take the right turn. And they know Jimmy's going to do that. So do not let Jimmy jibe before you and get inside. It's a split second decision. But unfortunately, as we look now, Jimmy's got the boat going nice and fast. He starts his turn early and the Danish do try and match, but they're a little bit too late. Jimmy's come out of the jibe, he's building speed, and there he is, look, have a look at it. He's beautifully lined up for this right-hand turn. He's got the inside berth. The Danish, well, they've let it run a bit too wide. Jimmy's faster, diving down inside, and the next crucial moment we're gonna look at here is when they hit the yellow circle. Hitting the yellow circle means the inside boat has right of way. We can see quite clearly as we zoom in here on the action, that Jimmy's on the inside as he hits the circle. Sehested and the Danish crew must let Jimmy slide inside, open the door to the pit bull, and he'll walk in. Here we are at the top gate three in the final race here in Saint Tropez, and this for me was the crucial moment in the race. This defined the race and gave Nathan Outridge the chance to take the win. We see here, his options are limited. He's aiming here, he's not gonna make it to turn right on that mark. So he's only got one choice, and that choice here is to sail on and tack when he thinks he can make it to the left-hand turn. Jimmy Spittle will know that, but right now, Jimmy Spittle's got two options. He can make it to that right turn mark in a straight line, or he too can tack and take the left turn, making sure he blocks the path of Nathan Outridge. Really tricky decision to make at the top of the course here for Jimmy Spittle. And as we wind things on, we're watching how this plays out now. And at this moment here, Nathan sets up to tack. And really, we can see Jimmy's not tacking. If this is his moment, he needs to tack right now to block the wind of Nathan Outridge and block the path. But he decides to split. He decides to carry on and take the right hand turn, minimize maneuvers. But what he's doing at this point is he's opening up a gap. He's letting Nathan split away. It's not a classic match race maneuver. Splitting away is opportunity for things to change. We see here now a few moments later and the situation starts to change really quickly. We watch the path of Jimmy Spittle's boat and it takes a dramatic turn to the right. And the reason that starts happening 
is because the wind is starting to change. The wind had been blowing straight down the course. That's the wind that Nathan Outridge is at this point in time. And over on the Saint Tropez shoreline, the wind had turned to the right and it started to blow there, meaning Jimmy's course had to change. Nathan Outridge, well, when that wind got down to him, one jibe and he's pointing straight in at gate four. And that right there was the win here in Saint Tropez. One split second decision defined it all. here race five and of course the big unknown on day two here in San Tropez was the acceleration of the F50s with these new 29 meter wings. We're going to pause the action and look at Ben Ainsley on the British team there, Phil Robertson with the Spanish team and Nikolai Sehested on the Danish boat here and their approach to this start. Of course, this is a, such an all-important start. Robertson and Sehested, they've positioned themselves well early. Robertson has good control of the route when he wants to turn to the line, as does Sehested. They're in control of their own destiny and looking to go for things. Ben Ainsley, however, 15 seconds to go on the British boat and he's up and foiling. We can see that. He's coming in fast. He's looking to snipe, try and find an opening in the fleet and that's where he sees the gap. It's a small gap between the Danish team and the Spanish team. And as he dives in now, he's committing to it. And at these speeds in this boat right now, he's got himself trapped and the gap is shrinking and the gap shrunk too small. We zoom in, we can see there's nowhere for him to go. He came in full commitment, but the gap had disappeared. He's infringing the Spanish boat and it's a big, big mistake uncharacteristic from Ben Ainsley and the British crew, but it really did ruin their race as he turns up here, can't fit in the gap, damage to his boat, damage to the Spanish boat, and as the gun goes, we can see the penalties already up on the British crew, and it was disaster that meant they missed out on the final here in Saint-Tropez. All through the season, the question of Mark Room, how much to give, and how much to take has been such an important thing. And we see here, we're looking at the British crew and the French crew as we come in to gate number two. And the all important factor here as we look at the British and the French is, are they overlapped when they get to this yellow circle? They're coming into the mark fast, as we see now. And as the British boat hits that yellow circle, are they overlapped? That's really the question that matters here. And there we take a straight line across the transom of the British boat. Can we see blue in front of that? Well, I believe we clearly can. So that says Billy Besson is overlapped and he has right of way to turn on the inside of the British boat around this turning gate. Now, as we roll things forward, it's a question now for Ben Ainsley to give him room to do that. And how much room is acceptable or not to do it? We see Ainsley turns toward the win. He starts to squeeze and to me, wow, I mean, there's just no gap there. It's really, really tight. And the onus is on Ben Ainsley to give Besson room. And to me, it just doesn't look like enough room in this instance as the boats turn tightly around the mark. There we see Ben Ainsley. He finally yields around there, but by going in that close, that early, you've really put things in the umpire's hands. And then, well, it's up to Craig Mitchell to make the call. Look at the bottom of the screen and we see the Spanish again. They're coming inside the American boat. We can quite clearly see that Phil Robertson is overlapped with Jimmy Spittle on the American boat there. And in this situation, turning left, the inside boat, Phil Robertson, he's got the right to turn around the mark. Jimmy Spittle on board the American boat needs to give him room to do that. And as the boats round up, we have a little chance to stop and look at it there. And there, look at the gap Jimmy Spittle's left. A couple of meters. Again, you can't give too much. You'd be giving too much away, but that's a safe distance. Gives Phil Robertson room to round the mark. And the interesting fact here is as we leave the zone that's marked by that yellow circle, the rights are going to change. And suddenly it's Phil Robertson that needs to keep clear. So he decides to take attack away before there's any incident. 